to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. I'm back with Design Biz Live with Corey Klassen and Judith Neary. Today, we're going to be talking about five fatal errors that you could be making in your interior design business. And Judith, um, Judith is going to start the show off for us today because this subject is like, I'm a little sure we're going to get her fired up here. So go ahead, (laughs) start us up. Tell us what we're talking about. Why are we here today? Well, thank you for having us back again. And uh, hoping that we're topping your best 100 episodes list eventually, <laughs> just saying. Uh, first fatal error is being insecure. So just just want to throw that out. Uh, <laughs> Let's throw it right against the wall. <laughs> right. First fatal error, being insecure. No, actually, um, apparently, Corey and I, when we've done podcasts with you before about 10 things I should know, we have math issues. Apparently, we don't add up them correctly, even though we know that math is a driver for our business. So I put this together and I'm sure we'll come up with more fatal errors, <laughs> but, um, what, a, and again, going back to our experience with you and re looking at our, our, our personal selves, our professional selves, the industry at large and how we handle ourselves and re not only revitalizing ourselves, but reinventing ourselves in many cases. Um, so one of the first fatal errors that got me really wound up is I got a trade magazine and I'm reading through it and it's about sales. Okay. This is, this will get you worked up Luann. And the, uh, the trade article had this huge headline and it said your highest profit margin will come from boomers. And then the article went on to talk about all of these surveys that are done and it's basing businesses and business models on, uh, um, uh, and on demographics. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I just went, this is just old school thing. This is just wrong in our industry that we are looking from at people from, uh, surveys, from reports, uh, from an age demographic. That's just wrong that your profit margin comes from how you do your business. (laughs) Say it sister. (laughs) <laughs> I just, I'm like, oh my God, I can hardly wait to get in front of Luann on this because it's, she's just going to get worked up. <laughs> and you to Judith's know. credit, like I, I don't, I don't receive this magazine um, up here in the North uh, <laughs> because we are privileged apparently, but it's a fairly common industry magazine. And um, when Judith was reading it out to me, I was like, are you kidding me? Do they not listen to us? <laughs> we're, yeah. we're about the psychographics, right? Yeah, not yeah, about yeah. that that demographic. Well, and I mean, so. I think you know what your point is. You know, I'm gonna check it with you because you didn't. We didn't go through these points. I'm hearing it just like the listeners are hearing it the first time. So, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that it doesn't mean that a good chunk of a, a particular interior designer's business couldn't be gotten through the boomers but the reality is is it doesn't matter what niche you sell to what what is the highest what what it, what creates the highest profitability is the way you run every individual project whether it's to a boomer or a millennial or a gen xer or the you know the forest the trees in your backyard that need the forest redesigned right i mean yep. come on Correct. right right Correct. okay so it's i love it it's a very very well place. made point yeah, yeah. Well, sorry it's, yeah. It's product, people, place. It's not who, what, when, where, why. Mm-hmm, so. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so the other part that really got me worked up is that you're making a value judgment about somebody. 
okay, without maybe knowing them. You're making a judgment if a boomer connected with you for your business and you search, search them out and you found out information about them and you're like, oh, here's a, bo a boomer. They are my perfect client because they'll have the highest profit margin. You, the, the most dangerous thing any individual makes is to make a judgment call or an evaluation about someone without engaging them first to find out what it is, if it's, if it's a good fit for you. Right. Okay. And I think this is Judith's point number one, actually, or is it point number two? But um, <laughs> Again, math problem. I, I have said this before, and I think I, it, it's something that resonates with me all the time in that your ideal client does not exist. It's not, it's not about, about what did, where do they shop? What do they do? What do they look like? And who are they? Do they, they? like pillows? Do they like <laughs> pillows? <laughs> right? It, it, you are offering a service and you are your ideal business. So if you lead from, lead from selling rather than, uh, I mean, I, I, there are, there are niches like you had a, someone on the podcast recently that specializes in bachelors and right. that's, Hey, if you can do that and it works, do it. Right. Please, please do it. But I'm just saying that that this this phrase ideal it's not my ideal client. Sorry, she came out. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that voice came out. Yeah. It, it just it's the wrong approach. That's that old think mentality. And um you need to kind of align to your business goals, not to the client. All right, so I had to push you back here a little bit. And you pushed me back last time. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, we're going to be here for another hour. Right? No, but I don't think, I think that there is truth in what you're saying, but I think we're playing with the semantics of what you're saying. Because Probably. if I hear you, what you're saying is, you're saying at face value that the ideal client doesn't exist, that you build your ideal business and you run that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Okay. And so then I just want to add to that the results of building your ideal business and running it in the ideal manner for you ends the up attracting place. that same individual Correct. that respects that back to you. So to say there is no ideal client, um, I think could be a little confusing based on the 400 plus set episodes that we've had where we've often talked about attracting an ideal client. So I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I'm, I'm willing to hear you say that it starts with deciding for you what you will do and, and what, what you will you not do. do. And then that leads the informs the entire conversation, which ultimately attracts the client to you that responds to that. Correct. Absolutely. So, that okay, is good. what I'm saying. Okay, good. Uh, I'm, I'm glad. I don't want to look at it from the outside looking in. I want to look at it from the inside looking Always. Out. Yeah. That's the only way you can do it. That is the only way you can do it. You can't decide. Excellent. You cannot decide to Judah's point. You cannot be um, any, any, you know, Sally Smith interior designer anywhere in the U.S. and read an article that says boomers have the most, uh, you know, what's the uh, disposable income? Disposable. I was thinking expendable, and I'm like, that's not the right word. The most disposable income, and therefore are going to be the best target client for me to go after. You can't because if you can't relate to a boomer, if you can't do the work that a boomer needs done, that the magazine article all day long is nonsense. However. Okay, to Corey's point, when you figure out what it is that you can do and it is the, what is the voice that you speak in, what is your, your ideal of being a business owner, then if men, because here's the thing, not every boomer is the same. Let's be serious, okay? We're a big group of people, okay? <laughs> All right, and we look, look at me, I'm a lunatic. That doesn't mean every one of my friends is exactly like me. The, the, the designer that's right for me is not right for every single one of my great friends because right, yeah. none of them are as nuts as I am. And I'm like, bah, 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 you got to do it this way. And when is it going to be over? Blah, 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 blah. Right. And so the thing is to say that as a boomer, I'm your ideal client is absurd. It's patently absurd. The article is saying that boomers have a lot of money to buy and buy as a demographic, you know, across the board, you know, percentage wise to spend. Okay. We could go there, but you can't go for the boomer 
as a whole as your target market because individually we are people. And well, I think the, you can. What, uh, the, uh, blah, 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 blah. It was my turn. <laughs> okay. okay. I don't have my sign anymore. I don't uh, have my uh, sign anymore. Anyways. You cleaned uh, up. <laughs> no. Oh, wait. Here. Here. I got a substitute sign. Okay. Here we go. I got a substitute oh. just in case. Uh, the Back in the beginning when we first started these conversations with you, Luann, is we gave you a psychographic worksheet to share with the listeners. Mm -hmm. I really, if you could repost that with this. You'll uh, have to give it to me again just to be sure. Okay. The psychographic worksheet, because it's not based on demographics. It's about, like Corey said, you have a business model and then you sort that out. And then, the, you know, the clients then are aligned to you based on a psychographic as opposed to a demographic. Right. And, and there's four more five fatal errors here of the five fatal errors. But what really got me on this is you're passing judgment or you're evaluating a potential client on the wrong set of values. And that is such old school think. And it really disturbed me because after the event with you, I'm like, this is just, we have a whole new fresh perspective on mm -hmm. the industry from fresh um, uh, approach to the industry. And if we keep going back to this old school, I got to say it, BS. I didn't say all of it. Right. Nate um, did. <laughs> what, <laughs> yeah, Nate did. Okay. So... <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> I know. Um, I really, I really, I got to tell, you know, uh, hashtag baby designers don't value, please do not make judgment values on appearances and demographics and, and the reports that you see about the industry. So please right. don't do that. Okay. Right. We could we could flip the script and say the same thing about millennials. How to sell to millennials? Let's, no, no, no. no. no can't go there. <laughs> right, 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 right. No, 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 no. I think your point's well made. I like it. I like it. Second fatal okay. flaw. Uh, I wasn't paid for it, so I'm not going to do it. Oh, that's the flaw. <laughs> that's the flaw. I thought you were like starting your statement with, I wasn't paid to say it, so I'm not going to do it. I'm like, what? I'm lost. <laughs> um, we're not paid. Yeah. Um, I know. I'm like, I don't pay you. <laughs> some, some, <laughs> sometimes you have to do things. This is customer service, and this goes back to sales, which, right. Luann, this is right in your wheelhouse. That's uh, it. Uh, Sometimes you have to do things for the greater good, even though you're not paid for it. Um, it's called customer service. Um, there's a difference between a customer and a client. Do you know what that is? I think, I think Judith, you're more talking about, um, yeah, there's a difference between a customer and a client, but there's also a prospect versus a client. And I think that uh, I hear a lot of chatter out there in the groups that talk about oh, my client, my client, my client, and, and until they have given you money, they are not your client yet. Right. They have to agree to the terms. They have to pay you. That's what makes a client. And to I think what Judith is saying about customer service is sometimes, sometimes you have to do things that are in your best interest as a business to move a project along that you may not be remunerated for. I'm not saying that you shouldn't ever be paid, but sometimes you have an attachment to a future objective, such as a product delivery or a window solutions order or a cabinet order, a countertop order. And sometimes you have to inject yourself into a situation to service your client or the project to move it forward. Right. The thing about, yeah. It's going to get stuck somewhere else. Right. The thing about it is, is it comes down to, I know 110% that if every single designer that has ever in a situation where they are either asked to do something without a fee attached or they're inclined, they have the idea to do something and they're and they're thinking I'm not going to attach a fee. We all know. I promise you every single one of you knows in that moment are you doing it because you simply do not have the confidence to ask to be paid for it or because you know you are generously giving a service to a client that has earned it. 
There is two different things. Yeah. And you know, the fact of the matter is, is I don't have any problem doing extra, more, better, free for my good clients when I'm doing it because I've chosen to do it because to Corey's point, I know that it's going to give somebody something. It's going to make us look like heroes. It's going to make my designer client, if I'm doing it for a designer, for their end user, look like a hero. There is some valid reason. The reason is not, well, I'm, they're going to be mad if I invoice them. Well, I feel funny if I invoice them. You know when you're fooling yourselves about, well, I just threw that in for free because it's a good thing to do. No, you throw it in for free when it's a good thing to do. Not, I can't, I can't. Right? It feels like a good thing to do. No, yeah. you do. Or it's, it's like, I'm really just scared to death of creating an invoice for this. You know yeah, what I mean? and I think um, there's two two ways uh, because we can talk about how t how this can kind of explode and come back to bite you uh or um be that pain in your butt later and i think it comes down to having a clear agreement with your client and then when the agreement has reached its limit and there's an additional service coming in you need to have a communication or some sort of additional addendum is what we, you can call it or a memo, memo or of an understanding. Email, something that that's communicates an understanding as to yeah. what the service is that you're providing what the timeline is attached to it and what the cost is whether that cost be zero dollars or not you need being clear with communication is going to be your biggest um asset Right. And I, I, I can tell you this a million times over that when you make a decision with a client or for a client, or you agree to not charge them for something, write it down and tell them. Right. I, you know, it's funny because I've been making notes while you're talking. And the simple thing is, is that I, there is one, I always say, you don't give somebody something for free without having a very clear reason why you're doing it yeah. and you make sure they know that they're getting it for free now this does not mean when you give somebody a nice gift okay i'm not like hey i gave you a birthday gift and i got to make sure you know that i gave you a birth you know what i mean we're not talking about when you're being a nice human being we're talking about as a business owner when you decide to in my case send an installer back for a second trip to do something that you know you here's here's a perfect example if an interior designer client of ours is going to order their own drapery hardware and we get to the job and the drapery hardware isn't there I mean, technically, shouldn't I charge you for that trip? I've got an installer that is nowhere else making money for me. He is sometimes driven all the way into Manhattan. I've paid probably $25 in you know, the tolls on the thing. I've got another probably $65, $85 ticket coming to me. You can take that to the bank on that darn truck. And we get all the way up there and, oh, the brackets aren't here. So sorry right? So depending on my relationship with that, that designer, that client, the whole scope of the project, I may look at that designer and say, don't you worry about it. I'm going to rearrange his schedule for tomorrow, get all the product here, and we're going to come back. And I'm not going to charge you the $450 trip charge. Oh, what do you mean? No, no, no. I'm happy to do it. Okay. You see, and the thing is, I will do it. I will let you know the money you're saving. I don't lord it over you, but I let you know that this was a big deal, but I'm willing to do it for you. And they think now you're a stranger client, stranger, call me out of the yellow pages because they don't exist anymore. Call me out of the internet, <laughs> right? Hi, window works. You know, I'm an interior designer and I have a project in New York and I've never heard of your company before. I found you by Google and I've got a project in Manhattan. Will you come in and will you do, yeah, here's the price to do all this. We get there. The stuff's not there. I'm sorry, sweetie. It's another 450 for tomorrow when you're actually organized. You know what I'm yeah, saying? I, like, it depends. You make a decision as a business person, what you give away, but you do it for a reason. And so, I think the onus okay, is okay. on... Uh, it's my turn. 
didn't know that we had a, a, a plan. Schedule here. Plan? <laughs> but, um, oh, I'm still going. I think if it were me, Luann, um, I would say, wow, that was a really generous gift. Uh, I'm really sorry. Can I at least pay half? Right. And I wouldn't take it from you if you were my designer client. I wouldn't take it, but it's awesome. And that's fine. My point is that I would not not be invoicing you because I would be afraid to invoice you. I'd be mm -hmm. like, you know what? Corey does business with me every single year to the tune of 50, 60, 80, $150,000. And that was an honest mistake by his project manager or by him himself. And you know what? Have this designer's back. Rearrange your schedule, rearrange and get back in. I don't nickel and dime my good repeating clients. I don't nickel and dime my one-off clients, okay? But, you know, if in the converse, if you are a stranger one-off client and you have made all the arrangements and you drop the ball, yes, I'm going to look at you and say, you know, this was a $600 project that now is going to cost me. And yes, here's another invoice. So my point is that we can't just take the way I go on and on about customer service and 110% you know, customer satisfaction. The fact of the matter is, is that's true, but it's based on good business principles and I choose where and when to execute it. And when I choose to execute it, I let you know that I'm choosing to do this. If, I, if you should pay for it, guess what? You're gonna pay for it. Okay, go ahead, can I Judith. talk now? Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, ah, <laughs> um, I wanna go back to my original statement of understanding the difference between a customer and a client. Um, my perspective on a customer is you go and you order a latte and you pay for it and you walk out the door, you're done. Okay, very similar to what you just said, Luann. The other piece of this is what is, a what is a client? So a client in my world is someone that you have an established relation or you have a relationship with, maybe, uh, within your community, maybe through a social interaction, but it is still a business relationship. And at the end, there's a possibility you might be in group therapy together, maybe, maybe not, okay? <laughs> but they're a client. A client is different than a customer. That's awesome clarification. It's what I said, but you said yeah. it with clarity. It's exactly, I love it. <laughs> so, and don't forget the extra layer you know correct. when you're just not sending an invoice because you're afraid to do it and that's not correct. acceptable okay love it so the, the the other closing part of this is um Corey mentioned this memo of understanding you know if you're going to do something outside of your scope at least have the communication that you know this wasn't part of our agreement as a as a courtesy i will assist with you in this process please understand that i'm not being paid for this and that should you know i be paid for it my fee might be blah 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 so in other words clarify with it and require a response right okay right. and an email train right. and that can be done in a great system like modomo where the client you can actually see that they read it yes okay right. they've right. read it so right. and the good thing about that too is is because their girlfriend who they're going to refer to you might find themselves in quote unquote a similar they the client might think they're in a similar situation but our criteria for when we give our services for free is our criteria and they might be missing something and so therefore the understanding is that this is a billable situation but i'm choosing not to bill in this situation so that there's clarity and also for that same client in the same situation six months down the road like if they do the same silly thing every time you're like okay sweetie you're gonna have to start paying me for this well one of the things that happens i think oftentimes is we get caught up in the moment okay as designers we just focus on what's happening here in the moment this crisis with this client not the customer with the client mm -hmm. and we fail to understand or have the forward vision to understand how that might play out on future jobs that's right we're teaching them and, how to be to treat us correct and and so that referral from that client but also from that contractor that you're doing work with if you don't step up and help resolve a situation or navigate a situation or mediate it mm -hmm. uh, in a professional capacity that's going to affect you down the line absolutely okay? and so having that short-sighted vision of saying i don't want to do it because i wasn't paid for it fatal error right fatal error okay. fatal error number two fatal number all right. two all right number three it's about what i like <laughs> it's not about you. No. It is about your client. Get over yourself.
<laughs> okay. I just, she said I, it. I see some of the threads of the conversations and I am just like, good Lord, put your, you put your personal stuff aside, put your personal preferences aside and figure out what it is that the client wants, keyword client there and live vicariously through them. Right. Okay. There is a difference, and, and Corey and I actually, and I'm going to challenge the listeners to just go look this up in a dictionary. There's a difference in, in definitions between advice, opinion, and recommend. I see so many designers commingling these three words from a personal space, and that is a fatal error. Fatal. Fatal. Yeah. Absolutely. I think when you have, um, <clears throat> to, to just kind of reemphasize Judith's point, your personal style or your favorite design genre or thematic design, whatever it is, that's great if you can specialize in that and that you do that and you have the clients to do that with. However, our job to or our career as being designed does not mean that we create new things all the time we are um we are appropriating other textures palettes finishes fixtures that are already out there in production with, uh, and services and allied professionals we're coordinating things together and that is probably a, a big a big thing for someone to kind of realize that very often I find myself, I'm not actually designing something brand new, mm -hmm. using a, uh, something I've designed before or something I saw before or something that someone else designed. And nothing is ever really new unless you're truly doing um, custom design that is truly custom. Right. Because you, being a skilled professional, um, you can be a specialist in, in an area, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're creating a brand new uh, quartz countertop pattern. Right. You know, right. that's a different kind of designer. Right. All right. Failure number four. Um, and, and again, I encourage the listeners out there to go look in the dictionary, advice, opinion, and recommend. Because a true design professional will recommend based on, on experience and objectivity, not something that's a personal driven choice um, because it's their favorite thing. Okay. Right. All right. Number four, not knowing your capacity or capability. Oh. Okay. Oh, now, that's sorry, a fatal error. <laughs> Bef before you hire the help, what is the plan? Are you going to be a small firm or a big firm? And then what are your resources for help when your zone of genius is just zoned out? Right. Okay. Yep. And uh, um, how, when are you going to take on that project and what's your timeline with your current deliverables and commitments? Um, I think that that's more about capacity rather than capability, but um, it, it, as everybody who's listened to Design Biz Live before knows that I scaled up, scaled down. Right. And that was, you know, a mixture of me finding my zone of genius all over again because I lost my inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, and my zone zoned out. Mm -hmm. So I needed to be able to create again because I went from being, an, an, um, being involved in a design to actually stepping back and leading a team right. of designers. And that's a very different, uh, it's a very different mindset and a very different process because you're much more of a coach than you are about a professional designer. Um, for, for me, I have found that I am best in my zone of genius when I can actually draft. <laughs> it's, so it's, it's a good lesson to learn. Doing. What yeah, makes you happy, absolutely. right? Design the firm that supports what makes you happy. Because to, oftentimes designers are like, oh, this is fabulous. And they're all of a sudden doing a lot of business and they're beyond their capacity as a individual. So they decide, okay, now the next step is to be a big firm. It's a huge step to be a big firm. And if you do not have the capacity or the capability to become a big firm, then you need to figure out how to be a small firm. I'll give you an example. Um, I'm, I'm much, I have a lot of technical uh, aspects to my business. And I got overwhelmed and I needed to find a resource 
that I could send the technical drawings or the, the technical applications to someone that understood how my brain processed design details. So I called up Corey, of course, <laughs> and, and, the conver- and the conversation went like this, okay? <laughs> um, Corey, uh, do you want this? And I'm like, yes. And then I'm like, okay, and I want this over here. I didn't even have to finish the sentence. Because he knew exactly where my brain was headed on the details. Right. So that's a kind of uh, synergistic-like experience that as a starting designer, if you are somewhere in a spot where you are overwhelmed and need assistance, you need to find someone that has, I want to call parallel thinking to you. Mm. that understands your vision and and maybe has some technical abilities uh, beyond outside of your zone of genius. Mm. So finding a partnership to, uh, in the industry, particularly if you're starting out and you're out of your zone of genius, you know, how do you find those partnerships? So uh, that's really, really important. Okay. All right. And I also just like in there, the, the conversation that, re, that surrounds capacity and capability is, you know, you must stage your projects. You cannot be afraid to tell somebody, you know, that, okay, I'm at capacity now and I, it's July and I could start you in October. They'll wait or they won't wait, but you don't serve them or you by taking them on and doing a lousy job. Because here's the other thing. You have a responsibility to your current paying clients and they are expecting a certain level and actual level of expertise and execution. And if you overwhelm your firm, not only does the new client coming in not get a great project, but the people that are already have paid you, their work is going to suffer. So you have to just put, you can, you can step back. And you can analyze and say, if I were to take this project on and it's going to stress my current workload, what could I do? What would I have to do? Would I have to hire a part-time person? Would I have to farm out to people like um, my business, my design business assistant, Brittany Elms, or do not let us design for you, Taylor and Ashley? You know, would I have to do that? Or would I have to ask a, a design bestie that I have to maybe literally partner on this one project with me? The thing is you don't have to say no, but you can't just say yes and not have a plan. And I agree with you. A hundred percent. I can give you a, a real example of something that happened recently where a project timeline um, kind of came back to me after my, my initial meet and greet with a very compressed timeline and it didn't follow anything that I had suggested. It was like, oh, by the way, we want you to finish this in two days rather than the 10 days that you, you had estimated. And I replied, I said, it's not possible to do that work in 10 days, sorry, in two Two days days. versus the 10 days that I have planned. Mm -hmm. I have other commitments. I have other client deliverables that I need to achieve. There are weekends in here. There's a long weekend in here. I'm on vacation at this point. It's, I have given you my recommend, my recommendation (laughs) for your service needs based upon what I can do for you. Right. And no is a real word. It and is no, a real it's a no, it's a word. You can use it. No. <laughs> yeah. And that's that that super important part of that project discovery call. And you need to capture as much of that information as you possibly can. So if the expectations are out of line, you need to say, uh, no, that's not going to work for me. Or maybe I can suggest a recommendation that will work for me and my business. Well, apparently we have touched on a nerve here. Well, we have. <laughs> a small one. Okay. My last uh, fatal error, uh, not having a code of ethics, okay, mm. for yourself, for your contractors, and for your clients. Uh, this one. is sometimes confused with setting expectations. Ethics has to do with conduct and actions. Have you defined a code of ethics for yourself and for your trade partners? Corey and I talked about this. It's about having internal values that you have to externalize, okay? Um, I recently had experience with a contractor, and afterwards, I'm like never doing work with him again because the code of ethics, even though they were um, and, and not, uh, I want to say, uh, they were more of a personal issue rather than a professional 
issue. He did not involve me in the communication stream on a project. And after the fact, it was very embarrassing to me mm -hmm. uh, when I ran into the client. Had no idea that any of this transpired. Mm -hmm. He didn't have the uh, professional courtesy to communicate with me. Done. Not ever working with them again. And did you bring again. it to his attention and say? <clears throat> in, a, in, in a very gentle way. Why? <laughs> was it? Why? I mean, you didn't. I'm joking. I'm joking. Oh, okay. I have, I, have, I have not had the conversation yet. That's why I have the upholstered two by four okay. um, hanging in my studio. So, but, but so what I want to say to you is you didn't learn about that until after the project was completed. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So, Correct. so, and I would just say to you, I would just say to you that if that was the only red flag with that contractor, so if there were other things, if he sometimes, you know, if he didn't do what he said he was going to do, if he was, you know, on the job site, he wasn't neat, he wasn't professional. If he had other red flags, then all day long, let that fish go back out to sea. Correct. However, but if he were, and I would just say, maybe that's not the case for this situation, but if everything else, there was no other red flags, then it, I think there's it's worthwhile having calling them up and having a conversation and maybe it's not the case with this guy because it sounds like there were other red flags but for somebody listening you know it could be hey you know what's crazy i got to talk to you about this because yep. i just had a conversation with my client and i found out that during the process you guys were having an email communication that you did not keep me in the loop on and not for nothing, but I guess everything turned out fine at the end, except that I was very embarrassed that my client didn't know that I knew these things. And I'm just curious is, was that intentional or you just didn't think I needed to know, or I was interested in knowing, and then well, you stop talking and see what he says. I did have a couple of red, red flags, a couple of stinky fish on this and, <laughs> um, more like stinky fish and some ugly seaweed and some other strange okay. things. Probably okay. a jellyfish in there as well, okay. you know. Um, just saying. And uh, have... have So that was a nail in the coffin, basically. It, it was. It actually was the nail in the coffin. Yeah. And I thought we could work through some of them, but just not going to. And, and the way I explained it is, yes, I did it on a professional email. Pro needs to be an in-person conversation. But I allowed him some understanding or in the email communication is that, you know what, eventually we can sort this out. You know, time does tend to take care of things, but don't react emotionally in the moment, you know, right. maybe give it a, a day or two sure. to sort itself out. But I realized that in, in fairness to him, I really hadn't told him, here's my rules. Yes. Yeah, say that's what together. I'm saying. You know, here's like that's why rules. I ask him why did you not think I wanted to know? Did you not think I needed to know? Or you just, you know, you did it by intention because right. if he's like, well, I don't know. I didn't think you wanted to know. Why would I, then you could say, oh, okay. I wasn't clear up front. You know, like write down your, and, and, and write down what your code of ethics are. Mm -hmm. My, my my biggest code of ethic is if you tell me, if you're going to tell me you're going to do something, then you better freaking do it. Right, 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 right. Understood. You know? No think, matter what, hell or high water. Right. I just want to offer up um, because I'm kind of silent on this one because I have a set of core values and I have a vision and a philosophy that I, I like. Those are two separate types of things. I also have a professional code of conduct uh, that my association asks me to to bear witness to, if you would. Uh, essentially, it's the walk the walk, talk the talk. Mm -hmm. So when when it says something like, uh, as an example, and this could this could explode, or it's going to make someone really think about it. Um, when it says something like, all design fees collected must be disclosed to a client. And that's in your professional code of conduct. That's actually there for a much bigger, different reason. But it's an association that has decided that that is actually really super important as far as their professionalism goes. You really have to look at these, whether you call them core values, your vision and philosophy, but every decision that you make in your business, whether um, it be about bringing a vendor in to your fold or working with an allied professional or taking a client, you need to assess those, um, the, what, the knowledge that you have learned to that point against your vision and philosophy and decide if you're going to move forward or if you need to gain more information or if you need to abandon this cart and, and just kind of walk away. So I have five um, 
pieces of vision that I state on my website. I also have a core value philosophy that I use internally. And if you were at Luang and Niagara Live, it's about the conversation. You would have heard me talk about it because um, it's a system and a process. Uh, it helps me develop a system and a process. Right. So um, it's really becoming clear on what those things are. And, and, and if you, you know, do it if you need it. But don't do it if you don't need it. Don't say, I'm not telling you you have to have this. Do it if you need it. Um, because it helps you guide yourself, make decisions in your business, make decisions for yourself, for your team, for your professionals that you're bringing in, for your vendors, suppliers. It, it's, 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 they're, they're really important to state, to claim, to put your stake in the ground and say, this is my territory. Right. I right. agree. A hundred percent. I, it's the first chapter in my first book, the making of a well-designed business establish, you know, your core values and mission statement. You have to, because mm -hmm. it informs the way you handle yourself in everything you do, whether it's with a contractor, with a trade, with a client, with an employee. And my bigger point is it teaches you, your employees when they act on your behalf and they are talking to your clients it teaches them how you expect them to conduct it. If it's only in your brain, if you're the only one that knows what's important to you as a business owner, what's important that's a projected about your firm, then, you know, how can they yeah. do it? How can they, how can they do it? Yeah. yeah and you, you know, and your, your employee evaluations need to reflect this vision philosophy or core values. They need to talk about it. You need to have huddles with your team members about each individual point and it needs to be a theme that you create mm -hmm. because you need to, your, your job as a bigger business owner is to coach and lead and develop and then usher them out the door in the most eloquent, eloquent way that you possibly can so, uh, because they're going to want to do it for themselves. Right. Um, but you, you need to, to empower them right. to make decisions right. and you can't empower them if they don't understand what the vision and philosophy absolutely hundred percent hundred and ten percent i guess so we there's two elements here one is for employees and for your company but i really i have to tell you you got to go to your subs to your, to sure. your trades trade absolutely partners. has to be okay. with them they have your team that your extended team. team has to right. be of the same value system right right yeah yeah and consider consider sending a one sheet to a new vendor or a supplier that you're you're considering bringing on and say hey these are my values that i'm looking for mm -hmm. do you agree can you fit right can right you, how do you feel fit? about this no, yeah. no not, you want to be not, part of this not sure that Kohler is going to agree to that, but just saying something uh, to think about. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they can, they can offer a three ninety nine anyway. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> All right. Oh um, my goodness. So that's so awesome. Those, those are my five fatal errors. I would ask Luann, um, if, if you want to challenge your, the listeners to the podcast, um, what are your fatal errors? Mm. I'd be really, I would like to know. Yeah. So what I would love for you guys to do is we need to kind of collate our information going back and forth between us and our, our listeners here. So what I have been in the habit recently, the last couple of months is asking you if you want to say something to me or my guests about a particular episode to do that either in the Instagram post for this episode, the Facebook or LinkedIn post for this episode, or in the Luann Nigara and friends. Facebook group. Okay. okay. So um, join that group, ask to join the group. And here, can I just tell you guys something? You will sit there and languish for weeks and months without approval to join that group. If you don't give us your name, your email address, and how you heard about us, it's not going to happen. You just sit there on the vine wilting. Okay, because <laughs> we have to make sure that you're real. This is for all of us. We want our own people there. Okay, um, and so um, so join Luann I Garen Friends Facebook group. Uh, have the conversation there, or like I said, on the Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn post for this particular episode on that day. All right, and then of course Judith and Corey are always tagged. Each guest is always tagged in the post for them. So for instance, 
the guest may not be in Lou and Nigara and Friends Facebook group, any particular guest, especially an outside industry guest. So if you, you're in the social media post for that day, that guest is tagged. And if you have a question for that guest, they'll, they'll get that question and answer you. But for like my peeps, like Judith and Corey, they're right there in Lou and Nigara and Friends Facebook group, and you can talk to them there. So, all yeah. righty, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here with me. I think this was an awesome topic, Judith. Thank you so much for researching. Well, it and giving thank you, you for thought. the therapy. Yeah. <laughs> Free therapy. <laughs> That's it. All, All righty, right. guys. Have a great day. Thanks, Luann. Talk with you soon. Bye. All right. So, as typical, the three of us get pretty fired up when we're talking about that 80% of our businesses that we all have to address in order to be successful, right? Before I review Judith and Corey's list of fatal errors, let's take a moment for housekeeping, shall we? At the top of the list is a shout out and a thank you to our sponsors, Kravit Inc. and My Doma Studio. You know these two companies are at the very front of finding ways for you to run your business and your design projects more efficiently, more intuitively, and more profitably, don't you? My Doma Studio is the number one place for you to get clarity on the types of services you have to offer and then package and sell these services in a way that makes the buying decision easier for your client. And if you're not sure what I mean, be sure to come to Surya on Monday, October 21st at High Point Market at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to be talking with three interior designers who have three different business models with three different target clients, yet they're all using My Doma Studio to sell more projects and make more money. This panel is sponsored by IDS, Interior Design Society, and My Doma Studio, and our great thanks to Surya for hosting us. To learn all about packages using My Doma Studio, go Go to mydomastudio.com forward slash a well-designed business. And I have to say, Kravit Inc. has done it again. They've looked at what you need and found a way to give it to you. Visit their new showroom at 200 Lexington in New York City. It's called The Workspace. It's a new generation of showroom designed with the latest technology right into the experience for the way you do business now in 2019. For a 101-year-old company, they always seem to be at the very front of new ideas and innovations. I just love it a lot. Love it a lot. Now, let's review the five fatal errors that Judith and Corey discussed. Number one, passing judgment prior to proposal, evaluating a potential client based on age, appearance, and demographics. Okay. So the point here is, is that you have to listen to your own barometer too. You can't just assume that, you know, a particular demographic is not your demographic because there are people that are outside of each. And I think that's what the point is here. So it is to have your own inner compass working. Yes, you do target, you do market to a particular ideal. However, don't be fooled into thinking that everybody fits into a box. And I think that's really the point of their, you know, fatal error number one. All right. Now, second one, I wasn't paid to do it. So right? Sometimes you have to do things for the greater good, even though you're not paid for it. You know what it's called? It's called customer service, (laughs) right? Now, there is a difference between not getting paid because you don't have the voice to ask for your money and giving something away freely, all right? Now, you may choose to give it freely just out of love, gratitude, appreciation, You might give it freely because you feel like it's going to earn you leverage. It's going to create goodwill. The point is there are many reasons to do more and give more. And that is a separate whole conversation from giving away because you don't have the voice to ask for your payment. Okay. I hope you understand the difference. All right. Now, number three. It's about what I like. Why can't they understand that this is the best solution or the best piece or the best whatever for the space? Mm -mm, Right? There are lots of times when you do know something is the best piece, place, item, whatever. 
And there's a difference between somebody not seeing it because they have no skills, they have no capability, they have no vision, and the times when they just don't want it, right? That's when it's not about you. You have to be clear and it takes um, skillful conversation to discern the difference, but it's your job. It's your job. That's the point to discern the difference. Okay. Number four, not knowing your capacity or your, uh, or your capability. All right. Before you hire help, what's the plan? Are you going to be a, a small firm, a big firm? What are your resources for help when you are outside of your superpower, your zone of genius? Okay. So Keep these things in mind. We've talked about this on the show tons of times. You need to find people who can do the things that you don't know how to do, that you don't do well, that you can't stand doing, okay? And give it some thought and don't have blinders on is the point, all right? Number five, not having a code of ethics for yourself, for your contractors contractors and your client, all right? You know, this is in my interpretation, this is know what you will do and what you will not do. Same thing, same sort of thing here. There are times, you know, it goes along with, it just brought to my mind, my other thing that I always say is, do I want to be right or get what I want? So there's a difference between when I make an evaluation between, do I want to be right or get what I want? So if I want to be right, I plow through like a bull in a china closet, right? But if I want to get what I want, I give concessions. I say, okay, when I don't really want to say, okay, I accept answers that I kind of know aren't the truth or whatever. But, you know, in order to get what I want, which might be to mend a rift with a client or a contractor, I might just let it go. Okay. But that is completely different from your code of ethics. And in my words, what I will do and what I won't do. So that's different. You have to set your list of non-negotiables. It's non-negotiable that a contractor would do X, Y, Z. It's non-negotiable that a client will treat me in X, Y, Z way, right? There's a line there, draw it, stick to it, own it, and don't be afraid of it. And that's your code of ethics. Okay. Now, if you want a free cheat sheet of the five fatal errors, as well as the psychographic worksheet that Judith mentioned, go to luannnigara.com forward slash goodies. All right. This is the place where I am making available to you any collateral info that goes with any episode. Okay. So the way it's going to work is instead of each particular episode having, and I know I don't do it every episode. In the beginning I did it. I think the first 80, I did it every single one. Right. But instead of any or whatever it is having, you have to each time put your email address in to get. We've decided, Nicole Heimer, brilliant woman that she is, to create one landing page, luannnigara.com forward slash goodies. And what'll happen is when I tell you there is collateral information that goes with an episode, you're just going to go there and look for it. So you're going to go today to luannagara.com forward slash goodies, and you're going to find these worksheets there. You're going to put your email address in. Hello, this is my lead magnet. <laughs> so if you listen to Power Talk Friday two weeks ago, um, and you heard Leslie Carruthers of Saver Partnership tell us all about the importance of a lead magnet. And I hope if you don't have one, you're at least brainstorming and figuring out what could be yours, right? So you're going to give me your email address one time. And then anytime you hear me on the show say that you can go to luannigara.com forward slash goodies, you're already going to be in. Okay. And you just check back and you get all the goodies you want. All right. So now last thing, are you coming to high point this October, 2019? Do you need a extra fabulous reason to come? <laughs> How about I give you one? I am having another power talk Friday tour in high point. It is going to be on Friday, October 18th. Okay you know, you've heard about these events and you've thought to yourself, mm, I'll need me some of that. I know you have. I've met you at the events and you've said, I want to come. Come to this one. All right. These coaching events are designed specifically for maximum benefit for your business. 
right? Now, I'm already, there's, there's a growing list already of people that have signed up. Sharon, Michelle, Sarah. So you know who you are, and I know who you are, and I'm so excited to spend an entire day with you. We're going to dig into your business. If you want some of this, you go to powertalkfriday.com. Okay, we're going to dig into your business, understand what you need to have that aha moment, that breakthrough, so that you can leave this one day coaching event refreshed, re energized with clarity and focus to build the design firm and grow your profit margins. Okay, now, did I tell you who I'm bringing with me? You know, you know my book, right? You know my book. A well-designed business, a Power Talk Friday expert. So in all of 2018 and 19, I've been inviting the various authors from the, this book to join me. And now in this particular group, we have Eileen Hahn, where you can learn how to make your company align with your values as a human being, that you can lead your company from your authentic self so that you have maximum happiness and joy. That's her mission in life, to spread happiness and joy. And when you meet her in real life, you know it's not nonsense. (laughs) She's truly, that is her mission. It's adorable. (laughs) I love her for it. But you need to experience it in person, all right? Then you have Kay Whitaker, dynamo in residence, that lady is. That's the truth. You want to learn about digital marketing, intern recruitment, year-end planning, planning, you name it, Kay can help you with it, all right? We're also going to have Peter Lang, the designer CPA with us. Bring your financials. Ask them, how do I read a balance sheet? What is a P&L? No question, too little, too big for Peter Lang. He is going to look at you and take you under his wing and help you understand whatever it is that is torturing you about your finances, all right? Now, I have to say, too, that um, you can also ask Peter if you are struggling with your own CPA and not even understanding what it is you should be asking or expecting of your CPA, you can ask that of him as well. All right. Then we are moving on to my gal, Nicole Heimer, queen of all things branding, messaging, web development, graphic design, and all around amazing lady. Right. I can't even, you know, you know, I love her. That lady is amazing. All right. Wait till you experience her one on one in person. And she looks at you and says that one thing, and you're like, that's my brand. (laughs) <laughs> it's an awesome moment. All right. Finally, I got the Vin Man with me and I'll be there too. All right. So the Vin Man is awesome. Bring him your spreadsheets, bring him your financials, bring him. You've, we've had people come to Power Talk Fridays and say, Vin, I'm thinking about opening a studio, you know, going out and, and renting a space. Do you think I should? And then he sits there and he work, walks you all through all of your financials. And he let, says to you, let's do, how about this? How about this? How about that? And we've had people, we've had a couple of times this has been a question. And some people leave like, yay, I can afford it. And other people leave like, whoa, thank God I didn't do it. <laughs> so, all right. We're going to be there all day. Excited to welcome you, to meet you, and to learn about your business. So please. Please join us and our sponsors, My Doma Studio and Revel Woods, for a day that I promise you will not forget. Go to powertalkfriday.com. All right, space is limited. That's how it goes. Small groups. That's what this this event is about. All righty, peeps. What what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? What action are you going to take today? How are you going to change something in your business? One tiny little thing or one huge thing? Maybe you're simply going to go to your calendar and you're going to block time for yourself to work on your business and to grow it intentionally, right? Maybe you're going to go to the airlines and you're going to book flights to High Point. I don't know, but... I hope you do something. I hope you do something that's meaningful to you and something that helps you be a better business person. All right. I hope that you decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast, 
podcast land and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.